So today I'll be talking about how building soil health in the southern region will reduce the risks that you encounter uh, in organic farming. Um, don't need to belabor the fact that farming is really risky. Um, you can have bad weather, pest weeds, diseases, all kinds of crop nutrient problems. One of the worst risks is soil erosion and degradation. Uh, a lot of soils in the south have suffered such severe erosion that they're actually lost all the topsoil or a horizon. Uh, here's an example right here. Um, and that's been eroded down to the subsoil or B horizon, which is an excellent resource, but you want it down below, not on the surface. Um, fickle markets and low prices, we all deal with that. But one thing I want to point out is that any time that your yield times your price uh, don't exceed production costs, uh, you encounter that financial risk of, of um, actually having a bad season or even uh, eventually uh, the threat of bankruptcy. So that's really the bottom line that we're facing as farmers. Um, in the South here, as I mentioned, um, we have warm climates, long growing seasons, and that really amps up the weed pressure, other pests and diseases, particularly root knot nematode. A lot of our soils are just inherently a little lower in fertility and organic matter than the soils you find in the Northeast or the upper Midwest. Um, we have a lot of incidences of excessive rainfalls, floods, droughts, um, and other weather extremes that can make it very difficult uh, to um, bring in a good, a good crop. Um, timely cultivation can keep up with the weeds, but you do have a cost to soil health in that it burns up organic matter. Um, <clears throat> organic, the organic method um, mitigates risks in two key ways. Uh, primarily, uh, the, the organic approach focuses on soil health and, and biodiversity. And this improves the overall resilience and tends to stabilize yield. Doesn't necessarily increase yields in a good year, but it will tend to stabilize it in the long run. And by relying on healthy soils to provide for crop nutrition, crop protection, uh, you can be efficient with inputs. And excluding synthetic inputs, of course, protects soil life as well as other beneficial organisms and uh, uh, the quality of nearby surface and groundwater. One specific advantage I want to emphasize is that by not using herbicides, organic farmers have access to um, greater flexibility in designing a diverse crop rotation. Like when you plant the squash, you don't have to worry about an herbicide you used on the pepper that the squash may be sensitive to. <clears throat> there are risks related to organic production. There are four key ones. One is because the organic system relies on optimum soil health, to provide for crop nutrition and uh, for other, um, you know, pest control and such, uh, we don't have the fallback that a conventional farmer has. Like if if yields start to fail because nitrogen isn't released quickly enough, or because a certain pest is getting into the field, you can't just grab something off the shelf that says keep out of the reach of children and use in this way. You can't just take that out and and uh, do a quick fix like that. Uh, another one is there is a constant trade-off because we're not using herbicides. We do need to use some cultivation and tillage in annual crops, at least, to, to manage weeds. So that's always a trade-off between the soil health and um, weed control. Another is that in organic nutrient sources, and we'll get to this in more detail later, they tend to be very rich in phosphorus relative to nitrogen and other essential nutrients. So uh, one of the pitfalls or one of the potential drawbacks is building up phosphorus to levels that are so high that certain key elements of the soil biota, the soil food web, go dormant. And then you lose the benefits and you don't have as healthy a soil. And another one uh, that organic farmers begin to face, especially when they start to work on the multi-acre scale, is the high cost of organic amendments. You're spending more per dollar, more dollars per pound of nutrient or per uh, acres worth of um, uh, pest control. So uh, these risks have been intensified thanks to climate change. And what we're seeing here in the South is increased intensity of rainfalls and more erratic rainfall. And we have this peculiar phenomenon called flash drought. We had it in 2019 
where rainfall had been excessive all of 2018 and into the beginning of 2019. And in very wet soil, so uh, crops don't grow as much root mass. And then if the rain shuts off suddenly and you get a couple of months of very dry weather, the crop is even less able to cope and the impacts of that drought come on fast. Um, the hotter average temperatures, especially summer nighttime temperatures and the warmer winters accelerate the loss of organic matter and they can stress soil life. Um, after these long warm winters, we have our uh, fruit trees waking up and then untimely spring freezes uh, uh, destroy the crop for the year. And another effect of climate change is that weeds and pathogens and pests are, are moving, they're spreading north and their life cycles are changing, getting more generations per year. Um, here's a couple of weeds that will get more aggressive as the climates get warmer, uh, Palmer amaranth and purple nut sedge. Uh, they grow best at about 95 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is when even the warm season crops are suffering. So we have an um, interesting, I call this the climate triangle. <clears throat> and as you build the health of your soil and you have a biologically active soil and, and um, crops are able to thrive better, they're more resilient to, the, to weather extremes. So it can mitigate against the crop losses caused by intensified storms, uh, greater heat, greater drought. At the same time though, that very increase in temperature is accelerating the loss of organic matter from the soil is speeding up the soil's metabolism. So more of that is being lost as carbon dioxide. Um, so it becomes harder to maintain healthy soil. Uh, and again, part of the upside is that the healthier your soil, the greater its capacity to actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and to uh, better cycle nitrogen and reduce the risk of emitting nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas about 300 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so let's talk a bit about how um, soil, healthy soils reduce risks related to organic production. Basically, they build resilience in crops, uh, they improve nutrient and water access, and as a result, uh, production costs will decrease. So the soil life is the center of uh, all the functions that a soil must perform in order to support a good crop. In healthy soils, there are many, many beneficial organisms, tremendous diversity, and the pests and pathogens are present, but their numbers are few and they are less likely to cause damage. You have less crop disease, um, the plants are more resilient, and uh, nutrient and water use efficiency is improved. And that's largely based on what I call plant soil micro partnerships. One of the best known is the nitrogen fixing bacteria on the nodules of legume plants. They can meet essentially all of the nitrogen requirement of, a, of uh, some legumes that may be part of it. In the case of um, others like snap bean, it may be up to 50%. Uh, but you get something like soybean or cowpea, they can fix almost all of it. Um, and actually there is nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the root zone of other crops, notably warm season grasses, including corn, that can contribute significantly to that crop's nutrition. Uh, we also know of, of learning more and more about mycorrhizal fungi. And as you see in this inset in the uh, diagram, they grow inside the plant root and they use a little bit of the plant's photosynthetic product up to 10%. Uh, but in return, they go way out into the soil. They just effectively double or triple the effective volume of the plant's root system. So water and nutrient uptake is greatly enhanced. And also having that benign symbiote and other benign bacteria growing actively, uh, other microbes being fungi and bacteria, having all that growing near the root um, crowds out pathogens and also Actually, some of those organisms will directly attack or consume the pathogens, and still others will induce the plant's systemic resistance so that even if an airborne spore, such as early blight or late blight, lands on the leaves of the plant, the plant is less likely to succumb. And then uh, the soil life plays a vital role in cycling nutrients and delivering it to the plants. When uh, organic residues and manure are, are applied to the soil or plants or you know, plant residues are simply dropped on the soil surface, the soil life converts it into active soil organic matter, which is like a, a, a storehouse for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. 
and, and some other nutrients, and also stable organic matter, which enhances the cation exchange capacity of the soil, which is its ability to hang on to positively charged nutrients, calcium, potassium, magnesium, several micronutrients, and the ammonium form of nitrogen. And soil life also uh, facilitates the conversion of insoluble soil minerals into the plant available nutrient pool. And because soil life um, is most active in the root zone, it tends to deliver these nutrients right where the crop needs it. So when this is working, um, you don't need as much uh, nutrient, you don't have to apply as much fertilizer and therefore you're protecting water quality and, and uh, saving on direct costs. Uh, the physical properties of a healthy soil also uh, facilitate production in a number of ways. When you have good soil structure, which is the result of organic matter being processed by soil life, it's an active process. This soil's, good soil structure makes it easier to prepare seed bed and, and the soil drains better. You can plant more on time, even in a somewhat wet year. Crops emerge easier through that crumbly soil. Um, and <clears throat> Cultivation for weed control, you don't have to do it so hard, so you're not degrading the soil structure as much and you're getting better weed control for each pass. One thing I wanna point out is that soil on the right is, um, that soil on the right looks very dark and crumbly. That would be more like what you'd expect in the Northern Corn Belt, uh, like Iowa and Minnesota, and maybe up to North Dakota. Uh, so if your soil is reddish or light colored and uh, don't, don't get an organic matters uh, inferiority complex, we can really build pretty good soil health here, even if it doesn't quite look like that. And your soil will still be porous and well aggregated to resist crusting and erosion and sustain soil life and fertility. Um, I saw a question flash up about how to measure active and stable organic matter. Um, there is a fairly reliable total organic matter test loss on ignition available through standard soil tests. And there are ev several measures of active organic matter, the best being what's called the permanganate oxidizable organic carbon or POXC. Um, they're developing field kits so that is becoming more available. Um, this is an area that we definitely need more advance in uh, practical research so the farmers can really get into that on the, in the field and really get to a better handle on it. Um, water relations in a healthy soil are greatly improved. Um, here's an example of a healthy soil. There's several features. It's very well crumbed. At the, at the crumb structure is excellent at the top, high porosity. Um, and uh, so the rain soaks in quickly and there are no hard layers that are interfering with the downward percolation of water. And because the soil is in, uh, has good structure, the plants can send the roots deep and wide. So both plant capacity to absorb moisture and the soil's ability to absorb and hold moisture is greater. So when you have a soil like this, your crop can be incredibly drought resistant. You say, wow, it hasn't rained in two weeks and these crops don't yet need water. So you need less irrigation. And another thing that happens is when that uh, rainfall is easily absorbed, there's less runoff and much less erosion. And uh, you have less disease and fewer planting delays as well. <clears throat> Here's some examples um, of what happens when you have, uh, let's see, I think, yes. Okay, let's go ahead and put it all up. Um, uh, these, these two examples from outside the region, but they certainly apply to our region as well. On the left is a field in central California. There are two fields. Both of those fields on either side of the road grew vegetables during the previous summer. One was left fallow and the other was planted to a wheat cover crop. And along comes a moderately heavy rain, about two inches, which is heavy for California, but not unheard of. And the wheat crop is using the moisture and uh, continuing to add organic matter, whereas the, the right field is ponded. On the right, you have the organic and the conventional rotations in the long-term uh, farming system study at uh, Rodale Institute in, in Pennsylvania. And organic management has improved soil health so that during a drought, the crop stays healthy, whereas in the conventional side, um, there is drought stress and it ended up with about a 30% yield loss. So uh, summing this up, um, if you have 
a really healthy soil and you are using very low inputs, uh, your costs are great, much less. And um, meanwhile, the soil health practices in a good year, you might have slightly lower yields because you're not pushing the system to the absolute maximum yield. You're, you're taking account of uh, the soil's needs to regenerate and using practices that support that. If you have a drought or a flood year, um, a depleted soil will show a severe yield loss, whereas the healthy soil will show a more modest uh, decline in yield. And the other thing that happens is what I call high input organics. You, you take the conventional practices and you say, okay, what does NOP allow me to use instead of 10, 10, 10 or ammonium nitrate? And you really hit it with the poultry litter and the feather meal. You start running up your costs and you can maybe uh, up your yields a little bit, but your costs can actually get close to or even slightly exceed your, um, your net proceeds. So you do not end up increasing net returns. In fact, you may have a barely a break-even situation. So how do, we, how do we build this soil health and this resilience? I'm going to talk about some challenges that we face in our region and some opportunities and uh, get into practical steps. Uh, the natural, uh, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service has established four principles for soil health, for managing for soil health. One is you want to keep the soil covered. Uh, in that diagram earlier showing the healthy soil and the rain beating down on it, if your soil is exposed like that picture suggests, uh, then even the healthiest soil will eventually crust over or begin to erode with that continual uh, force of that downpour. So you really want to keep the soil covered like this orchard on the left. Uh, there's a, a thick cover crop between the rows and a little bit of mulch directly under the trees. Um, secondly, you want to diversify your cropping system. Uh, the more different kinds of plants you have in the rotation, uh, the more diverse and more functional your soil food web, your soil life. So above ground diversity provides low, low ground. And you wanna maintain living roots as much as possible. One of the advantages of living in the South is that in most of the region, you can keep actively growing plants on the field most of the year or even all of the year in, in, in the warmer parts of our region. So maintaining those living roots is vital because that is the, the bread and butter for the soil life. That's how it gets its, its you know, daily uh, food source. And you do wanna minimize disturbance. Here's an example of a, a roll crimper terminating a cover crop. And then on the right, a, cover, a, a cash crop that has been successfully grown in um, a roll crimped cover crop. And one thing I wanna emphasize is that the living plant really is our number one tool for building healthy and resilient soils. Um, it's, the, it's the carbon pipeline we all need. It, uh, photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide out of the air, um, uses some, most of it to build the plant, but donates 10 to 40%, 10 to 30% typically, directly into the soil to feed the soil life that's hanging out near the crop roots. And as that soil life feeds on the plant root exudates and the root sloughing and then the residues at the end of the growing season, they build the soil's uh, tilth or structure um, and it also sequesters carbon. Some of that becomes uh, stable organic matter and the plant, the actively growing roots of deep rooted plants keep the soil profile open. And we'll see how that works. It's in, even in some difficult soils in the Southeast. So uh, the flip side of that is bare soil is at risk. I mean, it, it's, it's going hungry uh, nutrients will leach or run off depending upon your topography. It will lose soil organic matter. Uh, bare soil is, a, is just as bad as tillage itself for burning up organic matter. Uh, so even here where there is a no-till system but with no cover crop, uh, that soil is running downhill. Uh, the surface will seal and, and uh, increase runoff. And uh, Erosion is always a risk. So we actually hope in a situation like that, you couldn't get the cover crop in that the weeds do proliferate and that we can get in there and handle them before they start to reproduce. But these, this is a situation that's gonna run up production costs and therefore uh, farming risk. Uh, here's an example of a very simple practice, just simply cover cropping, a one species cover crop 
right here. It's at my home. It's our community shared garden. We had a nice crop of potatoes in the spring. We dug them in July. The very next day, one of my uh, uh, neighbors got right in there and planted a, a cover crop of sorghum sedan grass. And then uh, two months after the potato dig, we had a horrific flood. I mean, it rained eight, seven inches in one day. The, the river jumped out of its banks three foot deep through the field where we had dug the potatoes and knocked our fence over, but we didn't lose any soil. And in fact, that cover crop looks pretty well roll crimped, but it came back and continued growing afterwards. So um, if we hadn't had that there, I couldn't, I would don't want to think of the, of the uh, gully that would have been left. Okay. All right. So those are the advantages of healthy soil, but the journey to sell soil health, to getting from where we are now to a really healthy soil that provides all these benefits, there are a few hurdles. There's the direct costs like the um, cover cropping. And if you're going to start roll crimping the cover crop, you got to get a roll crimper. Um, and there's a learning curve always associated with new practices. That's going to be uh, a factor. There will be some income foregone, like if you need to rotate out of intensive production and get a soil building crop. And sometimes there may be yield trade-offs, especially around attempts to reduce tillage. So that is something that we need to find the least risky way to get from where we are to uh, really healthy soil. Uh, so first step, you wanna assess your existing resources. And one thing that's really good to do is find out what soil you're working with, what your inherent soil condition is uh, in terms of not only texture and drainage, but also the soil profile. Is there a, a hard compacted layer that's naturally present? Is your soil, does it tend to be naturally a kind of slow draining or excessively drained and droughty? Um, things like that you wanna find out and you can do that through the NRCS uh, web soil survey. It's online, you just look up your address and, then, and your field, you find it on an aerial map and you'll see the soil types that are, that are on your, within your farm. Another thing you wanna uh, keep track of is uh, what are your current soil organic matter and overall fertility. Um, you can look at that through field observation. You just look at how the, what does the soil look like? What does it feel like? Is it crust over every time it rains or is it fairly crumbly? Um, and also your standard soil test will give you a general idea of whether nutrient levels are uh, yield limiting and low or whether they're uh, optimal or whether they may be um, excessive. Um, and there are some new soil health assessments that are coming out. There is the Cornell um, assessment for soil health. Unfortunately, it's developed for the Northeast region and may not be totally applicable to our region, uh, but it does include that um, uh, active organic matter test based on permanganate oxidizable. Uh, there's another one called the Haney test that was developed in Texas. Um, some trials in North Carolina did show that neither the Cornell uh, assessment nor the uh, Haney test were really that effective in North Carolina. So there needs to be a more regionally or locally um, uh, developed and calibrated approach to this. This is a uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service recently came out with um, a, um, a technical bulletin describing six recommended soil health tests. That they include uh, an improved method for it, uh, uh, assessing total organic matter that's more accurate than what's available on standard soil tests. Um, and other, uh, there's also the, they recommend the uh, permanganate acts, um, active organic matter there is a simple test that was developed by a, a firm in Maine called Solvita and it's been refined. It's, a, it's just a respiration. You, they they uh, take your soil sample and you can be in the laboratory under standard conditions for four days and find out how much carbon dioxide is generated. And although this is measuring carbon loss from the soil, an active soil biota is what you want. So you want that number to actually be fairly high. Uh, there's others that are a little bit more sophisticated that analyze the, the soil biotic community, the different components of the soil food web, um, and the um, activities of certain enzymes that pertain to carbon and nutrient cycling. Um, we're in the process, I say we, the, the, the agricultural professional community is in the process of bringing these to the point 
where they are available um, in a practical form for farmers to use in the field. But this is an area of, of needed research. Um, anyway, uh, but you can assess a lot of that just by looking at how things are doing in the field and then looking at your soil test to see where the constraints might be. But when you look at a soil test, you want to look at those recommendations with a little bit of um, kind of read it through the lens of a living soil. And that if you have biologically active soil and it's well balanced, you may actually have more nutrient availability to the crop and less need for fertilizers than the standard soil test will recommend. You also want to assess your own farm resources. What is your knowledge and skills? If you're already experienced in doing organic no-till, then by all means, go for it. And what equipment do you have on hand? Uh, and of course, your financial resources. Your next step is to review your practices. Just lay out a schedule for your crop rotation and note, uh, are there fallow periods? Uh, when do you plant cover crops? How do you till the soil and how do you manage weeds? Uh, what is your, your typical cultivation schedule? And what are you currently using uh, to sustain nutrient levels and, fer and fertility? What fertilizers are you putting in? And then you wanna look for what I call the low hanging fruit. Um, you first assess where, where do these practices that you already have help with soil health and where might they be undermining it a little bit? Like, are you tilling more often than is ideal? Is your soil look kind of pulverized that, uh, after you've prepared the seed bed? And what are the benefits and the costs and the, and the risks associated with each of these? But then look for the, for the, uh, the easy solutions that there may be a fallow period. You say, well, I could fit a rye cover crop in there. And that's a very simple, that's a fairly simple step. You know, it might cost you about $100 an acre at most between the seeds and the, and the extra operation, uh, maybe less. And uh, that could be something that's easy to do. Or if you already have a cereal grain in your rotation, you can underseed it with clover as shown in this picture. And that'll start adding nitrogen and it'll leave that nice weed suppressing uh, soil building ground cover when you harvest the, uh, the uh, grain. And then you start building your resilient system. Uh, you, you do this kind of one step at a time on the one hand, you need a, a complex, a balance um, of complementary practices, like one practice, like just starting to cover crop or just cutting back on tillage by itself won't make as much difference as if you do several things at once. Uh, and when you add a new practice or enterprise or a new um, input, or you adjust an input, you wanna do a small scale trial and see how it works and maybe compare your current system with your, your new system. And also do an assessment of how it affects the economics of the farm, because that's, that's where some of the risk is gonna show up as, as I mentioned before. And then something looks promising, scale it up and then gradually make it part of your regular system. So I'm gonna talk about three, um, three main subjects within this area. The first is adding crops. Uh, and then uh, I will talk later about uh, reducing tillage and uh, modifying nutrient inputs. So when I say adding crops, the most obvious one is the cover crops. Uh, that's a key uh, soil health practice for any system and especially annual crop rotations and also uh, perennial horticultural crops where you have wide spaces and alleys between uh, your crop rows, uh, you know, like in an orchard. Uh, and then also cash crops. If you're doing a corn soy rotation and Simply adding a cereal grain, wheat or oats, can significantly improve the um, health of the soil, the, the uh, biodiversity, the um, function, uh, you know, when I say functional biodiversity, just adding that third crop will increase the soil's ability to cycle nutrients, for instance, or, and perhaps to protect crops from uh, certain stresses. And that could be a cash crop or a cover crop. A uh, powerful way to improve soil health is to add forage crops to your rotation. Um, and that could be in the form of or like a sod phase. Like if you have uh, intensive vegetable production and then you rotate that field into sod for two or three years, you're helping to regenerate some of the organic matter that was lost in, um, in vegetable production and, and the, the tillage and other operations. So cover crops, uh, you're all probably familiar with all these benefits of the cover crops. Um, 
And for example, this late summer mix of pearl millet, sorghum, sedan grass, and uh, tillage radish, their deep roots will break any hard pan and they'll also retrieve nutrients. Uh, you know, if I had put on too much feather meal on that, on that spot there to grow the vegetable uh, that I had harvested before this cover crop, it'll, so it'll retrieve that nitrogen so it doesn't get into our own drinking water uh, and be lost to the garden system. Uh, but there are some costs and risks. Of course, the seeds, the planting costs. You can have crop failure, uh, cover crop failures, to my embarrassment. I've had plenty. Um, and then it can make it more tricky to um, get the timing right for your cash crop. You want to grow the cover crop to its you know, maximum potential. You want to get it tall and thick and beginning to head out, like you see here. If you grow a cover crop to only three or four or six inches, you're really not getting much benefit for all that um, investment in seeds and planting. Uh, and in very dry years or dry climates, you can have an issue of the cover crop using water that you would need for the next cash crop. Um, the uh, Southern, Re so, I mean, not the Southern region, but the National Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education or SARE program conducted a series of surveys of farmers who use cover crops to find out whether and how they pay off. And what the farmers most often cited was the health, soil health improvement. Um, and that was uh, the majority, the vast majority of farmers observed that, whereas about a third observed uh, improved net returns and two thirds noted that the yields were more stable year to year. So that you have a rough year with drought or flood, you don't lose as much as I mentioned earlier. Um, improved weed management is another. Cover crops pay off the best after several years use. Like the first year that you grow a winter cover crop of rye or rye and vetch, you won't see as much as you do it after a number of years. When they're used as part of an integrated soil health program that you're using uh, some organic amendments as well. That's one thing I'll mention here. Uh, I'm not sure I cover it uh, in uh, specifically in the slides, but using cover crops grown to their full potential and using a moderate amount of compost or other organic amendment, manure, whatever that's within good nutrient management uh, criteria, which we'll get to later. Those two practices together give you more soil health benefit than either one alone. And if you add to that um, a reduction in tillage, a reduction in soil disturbance, uh, you will get um, you will get a lot um, more benefit than any one. Like if you just go a, a, a non-organic farmer who just goes no-till and relies on chemicals to manage weeds, it's not going to see much improvement in, in soil health. Whereas in conservation agriculture, in both organic or in, and non-organic systems, when you have the cover crops and the organic amendments and the no or reduced tillage, um, okay, this is a good question um, about the uh, cover crops. Uh, and uh, water limitation, we'll get to that. Um, so when you use them together like that, you have mo much greater benefits. And also when you have, you, you choose your cover crop with the goal in mind, like if you have weeds that you really wanna suppress, uh, cover crops for weed control, uh, there are certain ones that are best for that. If you know you wanna be fixing nitrogen or you wanna be retrieving excess nitrogen and nutrients, or you wanna be breaking uh, uh, subsurface hard pans, that'll guide your selection and get you the greatest uh, benefit. Another thing that uh, farmers find is that uh, cover crops can't be rotationally grazed. You could flash graze them and then let them grow back. And uh, that gets a little bit of financial uh, economic value out of the cover crop and it enhances your crop livestock integrated system. Uh, and sometimes that can, um, if it's done right, it will maintain or even increase the benefits uh, from the cover crop itself. And also uh, do take advantage of the uh, USDA uh, NRCS programs that are available to cost share as you pick up a cover crop practice, uh, equip and uh, conservation stewardship program. So another way uh, to diversify your rotation is to add cash crops. Uh, you have a greater diversity of cash crops, especially from different plant families you're definitely benefiting the organic matter and microbial diversity. It's actually been shown even if the amount of biomass doesn't increase, just diversifying what you're growing um, will improve both microbial diversity and uh, active and stable organic matter. Uh, it does tend to reduce pest problems, may open uh, 
new market opportunities and stabilize income. If one of those six crops fails, you got the other five to uh, still tide you over. There are risks, of course. You need two new skills and equipment. Uh, possibly it is a more uh, complicated system to manage, uh, and there can be challenges as well as opportunities in the area of marketing. Um, adding a sod phase to the rotation is excellent for um, uh, crop livestock integrated systems. And that sod phase, whether or not it is grazed, uh, has tremendous benefits to organic matter, soil life, uh, nutrient cycling. Of course, you get much less erosion while the sod is there. It really regenerates uh, soil structure. Um, you do need a tillage pass to terminate the sod and that will lose some of that carbon that has been generated. And if you do not have any direct economic use for the sod, there will be some income foregone unless you have sufficient, um, uh, sufficient land area to uh, rotate your production areas between uh, different parts of the farm. Then you can maintain uh, the, the income according to your current plan. Anyway, um, here's a big question that comes up. Uh, do cover crops steal soil moisture and nutrients in the, the next crop? And the answer is that they definitely do use these resources today, but they use it and to build soil capacity for tomorrow. For example, um, cover crops play a really important role in keeping that healthy open um, soil profile that retains soil, uh, retains moisture during a downpour. Uh, if you have uh, compaction either at the surface or at a subsurface hard pan, the roots don't go as deep, crops can't access the moisture, and a lot of it will run off if that crust is really bad at the surface. Um, you can also have depleted uh, sandy soils where the water soaks in really well, there's almost no runoff but it keeps on flowing past the roots because the, the soil doesn't hold on to it well. And cover cropping will help ameliorate both of these uh, conditions towards the healthy soil on the left. Uh, coastal plain soils in the southeastern United States have a particular challenge. Uh, we talk about the A soil, the top soil uh, where all the biological, the most of the biological activity is where you soil tests, where the soil tends to be uh, darkest and most brown and crumbly. That's called the A horizon. And then underneath that is the subsoil, which is often red clay in our region. Uh, not all parts of the South, but uh, probably the majority of our land area, you will find a red clay subsoil. Uh, it's called the B horizon. But some of the coastal plain soils, which are sandy in the topsoil, um, have a compacted uh, horizon called the E horizon that's between the topsoil and the uh, B soil, the, the B horizon. So you have all these nutrients and in the clay enriched subsoil and there's a moisture reserve down there, but if plant roots can't get to it because they can't penetrate the E, uh, then the soil, the fields will need subsoiling to maintain uh, crop yield, especially in drought years. However, there's been some studies in the South Carolina on a coastal plain soil where they simply used winter rye cover crops in alternation with a summer crop of cotton. And the rye during the winter when there's higher moisture, between the higher moisture level and the fact that the rye is a vigorous deep root system, it was able to penetrate the E horizon and then leave open channels for the cotton roots to follow the following summer. In addition, the rye cover crop just in a few years built up soil organic matter in that topsoil by half a percentage point, which is a big difference. You're going from 1.2 up to 1.7. And that on a sandy soil, that's a big difference in soil health. Um, and it broke up that compaction. And so uh, the cotton yields went up by 38% on, on two very sandy soils. Again, we have to do this. There we go. That's that same picture, but this is, a case where a consumption of water by cover crops is beneficial. This is that soil out in California where they had the two inches of rain and the winter wheat was able to use that two inches and keep the soil aerated and keep adding organic matter while on the right, uh, the, the soil ponded. And uh, this is just as important in our own region as, uh, as in places like central California. Summer cover crops can conserve soil nitrogen. This is a trial in Goldsboro, North Carolina. 
And it was one of these weather whiplash situations that we're seeing more of with climate change. You had a hot, dry summer and then record rainfalls in September. And we have a very diverse array of cover crops that they were trying out here. Cow, uh, southern pea or cow pea with a carbon to nitrogen ratio of just 15. So you would expect it would provide nitrogen to the next crop. And then sorghum sudan grass, uh, or sudex for short, with a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 57, you expect that to tie up nitrogen and really cause deficiency. And then we have foxtail millet and a, a, a southern pea foxtail millet mix. And what they found was that all the cover crops temporarily reduced soluble soil nitrogen. They just soaked it up, all these vigorously growing plants, and thereby protected water quality, and yet, all of them, including the high carbon uh, sudex, enhance the soil's capacity to mineralize nitrogen um, later on after the crop was terminated. And they all had a potential to reduce fertilizer costs. And we're going back to California uh, for another trial, again, on that kind of central California soil. They have a climate where it rains all winter and it's mild, and yet their production system is to grow irrigated vegetables during the spring through the fall, and they tend to leave the soil fallow over winter. So this is, an or, this is a result of an organic farming systems trial in Salinas in Central California. Um, and they were putting a lot of organic nitrogen, about 150 pounds per acre on the fall broccoli crop. And what happens is the broccoli harvest removes only 25% of that nitrogen, and most of the rest is gonna leach out during winter fallow. And they found that spring lettuce yields were very sketchy. As long as they were okay at 15,000 pounds per acre, and sometimes it was a complete crop failure. Whenever they planted a cover crop, even rye, which you think, oh, that's gonna tie up all the nitrogen. They found that by retrieving the nitrogen left over from the broccoli, all the cover crops they tried sustained spring lettuce yields at 30,000 pounds per acre, which is quite competitive with conventionally managed systems. Again, uh, these lessons certainly apply in our region. We have our mild ra rainy winters as well, although it rains in the summer as well. Um, but it just shows the value of cover crops in uh, enhancing nutrient efficiency. Okay, now this is an important question for those of you in Western and Central Texas and Oklahoma specifically, or anywhere in the South during a severe drought year. Not enough rain, you got your cover crops, your cash crops and weeds all vying for this limited pool of soil water. And in these conditions, the cover crops produce less biomass, they can get weedy uh, and they can deplete soil moisture. And yet, if you don't plant a cover crop, the soil loses organic matter and it loses its ability to store moisture. And especially in these semi-arid regions, if you grow a wheat fallow rotation, uh, if you're on like 10 or 15 inches of moisture a year, it's the typical rotation is um, one year of wheat and one year of fallow. So you have 12 to 14 months with nothing growing there. And this just lets the soil blow away in the next high wind. It's really, so it's really kind of a, um, uh, it's, it's quite a quandary for, for farmers, organic and otherwise, uh, about cover cropping in this region. However, what can be done is we look for cover crops with two key traits. Fairly good drought resilience, they don't need a whole lot of moisture uh, to stay alive, and also low moisture use, so that in, when they grow, even when they're growing vigorously, they're not depleting the water from the soil profile so badly. Um, in contrast, crops like alfalfa and rye and triticale, they're drought resilient also uh, because they are very good at just soaking all the moisture out of the soil profile. So if you come in in a, in a low rainfall region with your cash crop after one of these crops, you will be short of moisture. Um, conversely, if you're in a high rainfall region or you're having one of the flood years, uh, they're your friend. They're, they're keep they're draining the soil of moisture to the point where you can actually get in there and uh, prepare it for your next crop. But in these dry situations, you want to look up towards the upper left-hand quadrant. In the cool season, there are medics, which are relatives of alfalfa, but they are much more, um, much more sparing in the use of water. Phacelia is a cover crop that's getting uh, more and more widely used. It's uh, also good insect, uh, beneficial insect habitat. 
And surprisingly, field peas, such as Austrian winter pea or some of the Canadian field peas, the ones that are closely related to uh, snap and snow peas and English shell pea, they are fairly drought resilient and very light on, on moisture. So they have been found to be excellent cover crops in some of these very dry wheat, uh, wheat fallow rotations for the peas instead of a complete fallow. And it greatly benefits soil health, adds some nitrogen, uh, Bursine, clover, and mustard are other ones to, to remember for the cool season. Warm season crops, there's quite a large number. Uh, pigeon pea, which is uh, sometimes used in the warmest parts of the South and uh, uh, the Caribbean. Foxtail millet, pearl millet, uh, southern pea, also known as cow pea. Um, sun hemp and uh, partridge pea. They all combine low water usage with, with um, high resilience to drought. Uh, on the other hand, sunflower and safflower, uh, they'll stand up to drought, but they do it more uh, along the line of depleting soil moisture. All right, we're all faced with the situation. What rainfall is so wildly unpredictable and often we have to plan for both extremes. So have on hand and maybe even plant at the same time in your cover crop mix, drought resilient species and flood tolerant species. Uh, interestingly enough, Japanese millet has both traits uh, be a little careful with Japanese millet. Don't let it go to seed. It can be a really bad weed, much worse than buckwheat. I mean, buckwheat coming back is not that hard to control, but Japanese millet can be uh, this is a close relative of barnyard grass, and that lets you know. So be a little careful there. Um, but uh, those crops on the right, they can tolerate the wet conditions. And I've heard farmers say you can mud in oats and they'll come up. So if you were to come into the fall and you don't know what your weather is gonna be like, you might use both oats and barley to get the drought resilience and the, uh, some of the wet tolerance. Um, if it's warm season, you might go with the Japanese millet. Um, if it's a cool season crop, the white clovers and the red clover can tolerate some of the moisture. Um, so that's one, one approach you can take is uh, to cover your bets that way. Okay, um, <clears throat> second topic is reducing tillage. One thing I wanna emphasize is more and more research is showing that you don't have to eliminate all tillage to build soil health um, in your uh, rotation in any system. Uh, so um, in fact, there are organic uh, systems in uh, long-term farming systems trial that do use some tillage, but they till with care. Um, are actually outperforming the conventional continuous no-till system in terms of, um, uh, of soil organic matter and soil health. We have a question here about fava and barley. I think that's a great combination. Uh, it might be interesting. You might find that in a wet year, your fava bean does really well uh, and the barley will be fine in the wet year too. If it's really, really dry, the fava may um, struggle, but you will still have uh, coverage by the barley. It's actually a good combination because they have very similar uh, temperature preferences and, and uh, seasons. So if we take um, tillage reduction to its greatest application in organic systems, we have what's called, called rotational no-till or organic no-till. And what that entails is you grow a cover crop up to maturity, which means flowering or in the cereal grains, just beginning to set seeds in the milk stage and you knock it, you, you terminate it with a roller crimper. It crimps the stems, lays the whole crop down, and then you use a no-till planting system or a strip-till planting system to get your vegetable crop established. Um, tremendous benefits to soil organic matter, soil life, soil health, and all the trial farming system trials, organic no-till wins the race hands down when it comes to soil health. Um, the second tier would be either conventional no-till or organic with full tillage, and then bringing up the rear is conventional and tilled. Uh, and excellent erosion control. You got a mat like that. So what if it rains three inches? Uh, you might have some water logging for a short period of time, but you're not going to lose any soil. Um, and when you have a sandy soil, the slower release of nitrogen is actually beneficial. I had one farmer uh, doing the organic no-till trial with me He's out in the coastal region of Virginia on a sandy loam. And uh, when, he not, when he grew the cover crop and knocked it down and planted no-till, his squash yields doubled. And he said, I think it's because the nitrogen doesn't release and leach away so fast. 
So it improves the timing. The downside is there are a lot of risks and, and potential costs of this. You need a special equipment and skills. Um, the biggest limiting factor on um, no-till systems in the, in the South, uh, organic no-till is weeds, uh, especially perennial weeds. If you have perennial weeds, I would not try this uh, approach. Um, even annual weeds can overwhelm the system at times. Um, and you can have planting delays and challenges. And if your soil is heavier or you're a slightly cooler climate, like, you know, upland uh, mountainous regions of Virginia and Kentucky, we have uh, heavier soil, that slower nitrogen release can actually uh, hurt your crop. Uh, here's an example of a success. Uh, that's at Virginia Tech summer cover uh, squash giving high yield after Ryan Vetch. Uh, the failure with that broccoli crop was due to two things. I planted a very nitrogen demanding crop after a uh, rye, which tends to uh, tie up nitrogen in the short term. Um, and there's some weeds that were able to break through the rye and, and get ahead of the um, get of the head of the broccoli. Now that was up in Massachusetts many years ago. If I tried that in the South, it probably would have been uh, even more overwhelmed with weeds. Uh, <clears throat> and you often do get lower crop yields and sometimes it's a very slight reduction and sometimes it's a complete failure and it depends on a lot of factors. Um, so uh, what do we need to have good uh, no-till results? You need that mature flowering weed-free cover crop with a high biomass. I'm talking four tons per acre. If it comes up to your armpits and it's hard to walk through without getting it tangled all in your feet, you're probably right around four tons per acre. If it's up to your knees and easy to walk through, it's likely to be only one ton. Uh, I wouldn't do no-till. There should be no perennial weeds and very few weeds of any kind. Uh, and if your soil is already healthy and biologically active, um, that uh, will also facilitate uh, success with all of these systems. Uh, a long warm growing season, which many of us are blessed with, uh, is helpful because it allows more time to get a fully mature cover crop, get it knocked down. And even if the cooler soil slightly delays establishment, you still have plenty of time to bring your cash crop to harvest. If your soil is sandy and quick to warm up, um, especially if you do strip till and have a narrow open slot right where you're a swath of uh, exposed soil where you're getting your crop to come up, that'll help. Um, nitrogen fixing cash crops after a grass cover work great, like the soybean and the rolled rye. That rye is slowing down a lot of the weeds that, that respond to high soluble nitrogen. Like there's very little soluble nitrogen there. Soybean doesn't mind, it's fixing its own and the weeds are slowed down tremendously. Conversely, a nitrogen demanding crop like corn or perhaps tomato or broccoli after a mostly legume cover crop uh, will thrive and uh, utilize the nitrogen produced by the legume. And then there is supplemental mulch. Oh yeah, this, I'm keeping an eye on the time. We should have time for questions. Uh, thank you for reminding me to not take too long. Uh, the supplemental mulch application is often done. Uh, there is a, a grower by the name of Sean uh, Jadernick. I think I butchered his last name, but he has developed an excellent uh, no-till um, system for the South uh, for vegetable production, a tremendous experience and a lot of uh, tips. And uh, through this project that is uh, funding this webinar, we will eventually make that uh, presentation available as part of an online course. Uh, there are many questions here I won't get a chance to answer today, but uh, I want to say there is a lot of expertise with the organic no-till. So if you don't want to push the envelope and take the risks of no-till, um, I want to uh, say that there are other options for reducing tillage intensity. And numerous studies and, and meta-analyses where you look at multiple studies and get, uh, get a sense of the real trend show that any of these tactics will, vat, will significantly improve soil health as compared to conventional tillage consisting of either plow disc or rototiller with the uh, PTO at, at, at full blast. Uh, those really beat up the soil and create a lot of disturbance. But some of these other methods that we're going to look at are less disturbing, even though they give you the same result in terms of seedbed preparation and uh, managing cover crops and weeds. Sometimes you can eliminate a tillage pass or two uh, by using mulch or flaming or mowing of weeds in, instead of cultivation. 
You can overseed a cover crop into a cash crop, um, and that'll eliminate the tillage at the end of the season. Um, you do have to have the right equipment and also the right conditions, uh, low enough weed pressure to actually get that crop established. But if you can, that eliminates the tillage. Then you can retool. The spading machine shown at the left makes a seed bed in one pass, and it does not create a hard pan, and it's quite a bit gentler on soil aggregates than plowing and then disking a couple, a couple times until you have a seed bed. A chisel plow uh, to break a sod rather than the turn plow is better. You're not inverting the soil profile. And you can take that same rototiller and just by gearing it down, well, there's a grower here in Virginia, uh, his name is uh, Rick Felker, who's found that if he drives faster and runs the rototiller at a low PTO speed, he can create a seed bed without beating the heck out of his soil. And he gets through a field faster too. So it's a real win-win and with just, just a simple modification in how a common piece of equipment that most farms have is used. Strip tillage, I like this because it kind of gives you the advantages of both tillage and no-till. It creates a narrow slot of worked up soil. And again, using those lower disturbance type methods where there's a shank that's like a chisel plow and then a very light coulter disc that kind of creates a seed bed without pulverizing. You can leave 80% of the soil surface undisturbed under your cover crop mulch, and you still have this narrow strip of soil warming up and mineralizing nutrients and supporting your crop to get off to a good start. Uh, shallow tillage, this works great in situations where you're incorporating light residues or amendments, or your, your weeds are up, but they're small. Um, and it works with cover crops to maintain organic matter um, and uh, it also uh, protects mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, sweet plow undercutter. This is a great tool for drier regions, uh, such as out in the um, uh, western part of Texas and Oklahoma. It shallowly undercuts cover crops and weeds, leaves the residue on the surface, and leaves most of the soil profile undisturbed. Saves moisture, all that residue cuts wind erosion, uh, and improvements in crop yields have been noticed have been documented in other semi-arid regions. I see I'm just about out of time. Uh, I just want to go quickly through this adjusting inputs. Less may be better and it saves money. I'm going to go through this quickly. You can look this up um, on your um, uh, when the webinar is archived. Uh, nitrogen is tricky. Uh, nitrogen can be limiting and cut your yields, especially when your soil life isn't yet, your soil health isn't yet up to par. Um, but overusing organic nitrogen, such as poultry litter or even feather meal, it adds to cost. It actually burns up organic matter, just like conventional nitrogen fertilizers do. It can reduce the soil's ability to release nitrogen, and it can hurt water quality. Uh, there was an experiment in Clemson, at Clemson University where they had soil. It was a sandy loam, but they built up through a long-term best organic management, built up organic matter to 4.6%. And when they grew a rye and crimson cover crop, their tomato and squash did not need any nitrogen to achieve maximum yield. They were getting it all from the soil and the cover crop. Uh, another thing to note, um, compost and manure, they're great resources, but use them with discretion and in moderation. There were some very interesting trials showing the response of heavy feeding crops. And I'm talking corn and brassicas, which are really the really heaviest nitrogen yielders, uh, users. And then some common weeds like uh, uh, pigweed and foxtails and uh, ragweed. The growth of the crops leveled off at the recommended rate. The growth of the weeds kept going up and up and up as the rates were increased beyond the recommended level. And you do get a buildup of excess phosphorus, which shuts down your mycorrhizal fungi and you lose a lot of the benefits of that part of the soil food web. Um, uh, just gonna be really quickly here, just want to note that especially vegetable crops, your harvests don't take much phosphorus out of the field relative to nitrogen and potassium. Uh, grains and hay take a little bit more. They actually, vegetables are thought to be heavy feeders, and in a way they are. They do need uh, decent levels of nutrient availability, but that can be achieved through soil biology. And look at the organic amendments. The two most common, a, a compost, this would be a manure compost with a moderate, with a typical analysis of 111. And then poultry fertilizers, uh, 543, they will give you the nitrogen and potassium you need, but many, many times, four or five times the phosphorus. 
Okay. Um, this is a, a, this really struck me. This is a University of Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, soil test. Pot uh, potassium was abundant, was borderline excessive. Phosphorus was optimal, high, and I was going to grow tomato. And they're recommending phosphorus and potassium. We don't really need it. And uh, these toil soil tests focus on the top six inches. They ignore soil life and the uh, depth the subsoil that uh, deep-rooted crops can uh, access, and they actually assume that soils are going to lose nutrients. Um, and in fact, Robin Clute gave a presentation. He says, living soil changes everything. You had a five-year trial with a corn soy wheat rotation, organic practices with cover crops and a little bit of um, compost on an loamy sand, a typical coastal plain soil, not high inherent fertility. He didn't use any phosphorus or potassium because they already tested in that high optimum range. And he cut the nitrogen rate by half, the recommended rate by half. The results were full crop yields, stable soil test nutrient levels, and an increase in organic matter uh, from 1.2 to 1.7 percent. Again, an excellent result for a very sandy soil. So um, input frugality, you can achieve it by just doing side-by-side -side trials. Try your fertilizer and then try at a half rate and try it without any. How do the crop respond? How does the soil seem? And if there was a yield increase, did it pay for the input? Um, and basic uh, soil health practices will increase that ability to be frugal with nutrients. And when you integrate crops and livestock, you further reduce your need to bring other nutrient sources onto the farm. Um, so, uh, you know, test your soil. Uh, there are a few, few tips here. Uh, legumes will save money on nitrogen. <clears throat> and the, um, the credit from nitrogen and legumes, you want to be sure to take that into account so you're not over applying nitrogen when you don't need it. Sometimes you will need nitrogen, like if the soil is cool or the soil health isn't yet up to snuff, you've been just recently converted to conventional field. Try to apply a little bit of concentrated nitrogen right in the row or by in-row drip or, or banding. That way you won't overwhelm the entire soil with soluble nitrogen, suppress beneficial microbes and stimulate weed growth. And then watch the phosphorus levels. Once you get to high levels, you cut your compost rate. So you're just replenishing what you take off. Okay, there's some resources and um, you can look those up later. I'm sorry, I did go a few minutes over uh, and thanks for your patience. That's great, Mark. Thank you. Um, we didn't go very long over time, just four minutes. So um, we have plenty of time for questions. And um, we're going to start the question and answer period. So if you have a question, you can just type it into the Q&A box on your screen. And we'll be reading the questions out loud until we run out of time. I noticed some in the chat box as well. Um, but if you could put them in the Q&A box, that would be great, because that way I won't have to keep switching back and forth when I'm looking for the questions. Um, I just want to also mention mention um, that um, we uploaded the slides and extra presentation notes from Mark and I put the link to that in the chat box and um, also this webinar is being recorded so you'll be able to find the recording in about a week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. Um, we'll also be sending you a quick evaluation survey by email later today with a link to where, um, with where you can find the slides and we'd really appreciate any feedback that you have. So I'm going to just um, look in the Q&A box here and see what we've got. I know um, we just got a question. Are organic farmers trending away from crop rotations and focusing more on soil building by adding biology into the soil? Um, that was sort of the first part of this question. Um, and if so, what's the most efficient way organic farmers are applying this biology? So this question had a couple parts. So I'm just going to start with that. So uh, this is Emily Oakley, and um, I'm here to join you guys for some of the Q&A. And I wanted to see, though, if Mark wants to take a first stab at any of these questions or if it's something that you would like me to go ahead and try and answer. Um, I would say um, that absolutely we are not going – I'm not recommending going away from rotations. I think rotations are a vital part. I didn't spend as long on that specific topic, but uh, simply adding cover crops is diversifying your rotation. Uh, 
That is a good question because increasing the diversity uh, and also the tightness, in other words, no, no bare fallow periods of the rotation is going to improve the biology, uh, often as much or more than adding uh, special inoculants. Yeah, and I think I'd just add that I don't think that organic farmers are moving away from rotation. It's a really integral part of what we do. Um, it's it's really a foundation of fertility and crop diversity and risk management. But I also agree with Mark that having the cover crop is another form of rotation within a system, and it's especially helpful, I think, in high tunnels, um, heated or unheated, when it's when it's feasible for growers to do them. Um, but is essential for you know, just overall farm management within all organic systems, regardless of what other sort of fertility approaches farmers might be experimenting with. Yeah, I just want to mention also we have an organic article that we recently published on cover crops in high tunnels. Um, I think more growers are moving towards doing that. Um, and you can find that on the eorganic.org website under the topic cover crops. Um, so thanks, Emily, for joining us for questions here. Um, let's see, we have another question. This one might be for Mark um, because um, you were talking earlier about um, soil tests. And can you tell people where they might be able to get um, soil test kits that you, you were discussing? Uh, oh, the soil health test kits? Yeah. Um, actually, I'm not up on where they are currently available, um, especially here in the South. Um, if someone wants to type that into the chat box and share that with everybody, um, if they happen to know the answer to that, that would be really great too. Yeah, that would be great. Um, okay. I would maybe start with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, your local office. Yeah, there is a kit that NRCS has had for a long time. It's a field kit that just measures some simple things like um, infiltration and um, the phys soil physical properties. Um, that can be useful. Okay. And as I mentioned, they are developing they are developing those um, those uh, six methods that are most highly recommended. They did a review of a, of a lot of the research uh, in this area. Okay. Um, okay. So here's another question: um, Soil quality degradation is the result of monoculture crop livestock separation ad adapted by adopted by farmers in the last 50 to 60 years. Why are conservationists and soil quality advocates not promoting the integration of livestock um, with public financial assistance? Ah, good question. Mark, do you want to <laughs> take that? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. I think I would take that up to the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. You know, I realize that there are a lot of good um, uh, conservation practices and activities focus on both crops and livestock, um, but there hasn't been that much on crop livestock integration. It's an excellent question, needs a lot more support. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanna appreciate the question. <laughs> okay. And I'll just add that, um, you know, there, it's a great question, but there are also plenty of pioneering farmers that have been working in this area, like Full Belly Farm in California, which although it's in California, has some similarities for sure in terms of climate challenges, um, especially during the growing season. They have a lot of experience integrating livestock with vegetable production. Um, as a small vegetable producer myself, I'll just say that there are challenges to integrating livestock in a production system because Sometimes it's hard enough just to keep the vegetables alive, um, much less integrating in livestock that has its own set of needs and attention requirements. So um, it's definitely a model that can work, but it also does pose some challenges. Yeah, I imagine it can be pretty challenging if your pigs get into the mescaline crop. <laughs> that and, you know, just, you know, your hands are very full when you're trying yeah. to keep track of a diverse vegetable system and um, you know, sometimes we want to do everything because we have this romantic idea of what our farm is going to be. I know that was the case for me when I started my farm. Um, and sometimes over time, we realize some things, you know, are, are less either business profitable um, or time management feasible. Not that organic lifestyle doesn't work, though, because definitely check out Full Belly. It's a great resource. I just want to quickly add uh, something that I heard from some of my colleagues over at the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. 
I was asking, why aren't there more people in the Midwest cover cropping and integrating livestock and crop? Because the, the uh, advantage is so huge. And what the answer was, a lot of them do the corn soy Miami rotation, which is grow your summer crop, leave the farm and, and spend the winter in, in the South, in, in Florida. Uh, so there is that issue of it being management intensive to take care of the land. I think that's what it comes down to for a lot of us. Now that was with regard to conventional corn, you know, corn soy farmers, not, it's not that relevant to organic, but it illustrates the, um, the quandary of uh, management intensiveness of uh, soil health systems. Okay. Um, how can organic soil health practices be helpful in saline um, conditions, especially mitigating saline water for raising crops in arid or semi-arid regions. Emily, you want to take a crack at that? Well, I'm not really in a semi-arid region, but I know that this becomes a problem for sure in hoop houses. Um, so I will let Mark take the biggest crack at this, but I, I know this may sound somewhat... Um, like at the catch-all that I love to use for everything, but I feel like cover crops actually play an extremely important role in these conditions, um, both for the obvious, you know, case of soil organic batter or building, um, but just also the introduction of the diversity of vegetative matter, especially when you can get a really diverse cover crop into um, a high tunnel saline situation. Um, Mark, do you want to take a stab um, for the more arid regions? Uh, well, this is not an area that I have a lot of personal experience with, although I studied up on it some uh, when I did a soil health series for Western SARE, a uh, series of webinars. Uh, I know one situation is called saline seeps, where you have uh, undulating or rolling or hilly land, and uh, there is uh, when there's very little vegetation because you're in a, in a relatively arid region, when the rains do come, the salts will leach out of the soil in the higher elevation, and then they'll actually seep come back to the surface, especially if there's a, 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 a restrictive uh, water impermeable layer at some depth under the, you know, in the subsoil. And these saline seeps will occur in lower lying areas. You see salt accumulating on the surface and the soil becomes just, you know, unproductive because it's so salty. If you grow a cover crop to consume the moisture, you actually stop that seepage process and the salts don't migrate. Uh, there are some cover crops that are more tolerant to salts than others. Uh, I think the medics and the, uh, I know that barley is fairly salt tolerant. Uh, another thing is if you're growing cover crops and restoring fertility that way, you don't need as much fertilizer and fertilizers themselves, even organic sources, but you know, any, uh, it can can add to the salinity of the soil. Uh, that is a that is a trickier area. How do you how do you mitigate this? Um, and if it's irrigation water that is is uh, saline, if your source is saline, um, the more you can reduce your need for irrigation, and the more you can depend on natural rainfall and soil moisture storage. Um, the uh, less salts you'll be adding to the water through the irrigation. So okay. probably the first step is any uh, make sure that every drop of water that falls from the sky stays on your land and this gets used by your crops and doesn't leach away and then make you need more irrigation because rain doesn't have any salt in it. Okay. Um, we have a couple of people that are interested in the undercutting tool that you um, pictured um, and um, I was wondering if you knew if anywhere there's um, a PDF with a drawing of that under a cutting tool um, and how much it costs. Uh, I unfortunately, I'm not much of an equipment person, so I don't know much of the details about how to get a hold of one of these. Um, I would go online. Uh, they're used a lot out west. Uh, the, the successes have been in Nebraska and uh, parts of the Intermountain West and interior Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'm, there may well be farmers in Texas who are, who are using it or researchers who are working with it. Uh, but I would say 
um, start with the internet. You can search, they're, they're either called the sweet plow undercutter or simply the blade plow. Um, yeah, that's where I'd start. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a good start. Um, by what mechanism does excess phosphor phosphorus negatively affect fun fungi and does excess phosphorus affect other aspects of nutrient availability? Good question. The uh, mycorrhizal fungi that associate with crops, they, they, they perform a number of different functions. One is to absorb, um, is to enhance the crop's access to phosphorus. The mycorrhizal fungi go out into the soil and they'll solubilize, they'll unlock insoluble phosphorus. Now the plant has to invest 10%, five to 10% of its energetic, uh, of its photosynthetic product into the mycorrhizae to have an active partnership. And the mycorrhizae are performing many functions. They're improving uh, moisture uptake, drought resilience, uptake of a wide range of nutrients in addition to the phosphorus. But what happens is if phosphorus is plentiful, the plant doesn't invest in the mycorrhizal. It does not enter into that that uh, symbiotic partnership and all the other beneficial functions are lost. I mean, uh, the uh, mycorrhizal fungi are known for their capacity to sequester carbon as stable organic matter and their ability to help plants, uh, protect plants against diseases. So uh, another thing that high phosphorus levels will do is it can tie up other nutrients, especially micronutrients, uh, there is a relationship between phosphorus and zinc. Now, fortunately, if you build up a little excess phosphorus through organic amendments like compost and manure, and especially poultry litter, you tend to raise your zinc level as well. So you're not likely to tie that one up. However, high phosphorus soils in general do make uh, zinc and copper and other micronutrients somewhat less available to the crop. And of course, very high phosphorus levels, you will start getting runoff and damaged surface water ecosystems. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Oh, another thing is that there is some evidence that it isn't just nitrogen excesses that stimulate weeds or some that respond very vigorously to high levels of phosphorus. So uh, there's that issue too. Okay, um, let's see. We have a question about um, whether you have any recommendations for garlic growers that want to reduce tillage and weed pressure. Um, the person wants to get away from using plastic mulch. Ah, uh, well, I've heard of one system where, uh, so garlic is planted in the, in the late fall, usually after the first frost, you want to plant it so that the garlic has time to put out some roots, but doesn't try to come up and then get frozen back. Now, of course, I'm talking in colder climates like um, Appalachian region of Virginia and, and uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, but uh, in that circumstance and further north, uh, what growers will often do is plant a cover crop that will grow in the fall like oats and uh, field peas, but will die uh, when winter sets in. And if you get into the uh, warmer parts of the south, you'd have to adjust what that cover crop mix is. And of course, if you don't have uh, ever have hard freezes, uh, the system won't work. Uh, but you can grow your mulch in place, plant the garlic, you come through with a strip tiller system and um, planting the garlic in these narrow slots and you let that cover crop grow up and then die back, uh, leaving a mulch. Um, also, yeah, the uh, tree leaf mulch is good. Uh, hay mulch, uh, I would think that um, uh, garlic really, I've always found that garlic does very well in, in organic mulches. Uh, now it's not the same crop, but I, I once planted some uh, onion sets in the early spring in an area where pearl millet had winter killed. And I just raked off the, the millet and stuck the, the uh, cloves, the uh, uh, sets in the ground and put the millet back. And I had uh, very little weed pressure there. So um, I think there are definitely alternatives to plastic uh, with, with garlic production. Could yeah. I also just throw in? Absolutely. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, no, go ahead. Yeah, the suggestion of a summer cover crop um, that will get a lot of biomass and cover that you can then mow down um, 
and preferably obviously be able to kill um, before you plant your garlic. And uh, if you can get a frost, which isn't always the case before planting the garlic, you can plant directly into that killed summer cover crop. And you've basically, you know, grown in essence, your mulch. Of course, you're going to have to do that over already created raised beds if you're in a raised bed system, but that, that doesn't, you know, isn't necessarily too big of a challenge. Um, And then I, I totally agree that hay mulches are an extremely effective form for mulching without plastic for garlic. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just put another link in the chat box. Um, one of our attendees shared a link to the NRCS soil health assessment. And um, someone else um, commented also that um, NRCS has a kit available. Um, let's see, and NC State has a soil lab, but they don't test microbial levels. So thanks for those resources. Okay, um, another question about testing. Is there a way to measure um, soil carbon sequestration? Oh, big topic because <laughs> the whole issue of climate adaptation and mitigation through organic and sustainable agriculture is now, uh, is especially uh, in the coming year, is going to be uh, a major policy discussion um, on Capitol Hill and within the USDA as well. Uh, That is very tricky because uh, you have to measure the whole soil profile. If you just look at the top six inches and say, oh yeah, it looks like no-till sequesters more carbon than cover crops with with, uh, moderate tillage, you're not paying attention to what's going on from six inches down to the reach of the crop roots, which might be six feet. Uh, However, it is is no mean task to uh, estimate all of the carbon in the top three, four, six feet of soil, which we really need to do and be able to monitor that um, accurately. So when I, I've been working with Organic Farming Research Foundation on issues of uh, organic agriculture in relation to climate. And right now I find myself focusing more on the resilience aspect. When you build up your healthy soil, your system is gonna be much more resilient and capable of sustaining production through uh, climate change. Uh, And we can be fairly confident that uh, the more soil health practices you implement, the more carbon you will store in the soil. We can't quantify it right now and guarantee that, you know, if you do this, this, and this, you'll put a a ton per acre of carbon in. Um, In general, perennial systems and crop lives, um, uh, management intensive rotational grazing are extremely effective at uh, sequestering carbon. And there've been studies both in the Southern region as well as out West and and in in the North Central region and the Northeast showing that uh, when you have an advanced grazing management systems, uh, you can be sequestering a ton of carbon per acre per year for about 10 years. And then eventually you get to a new plateau where the soil is really healthy and it will be uh, it'll just reach this new steady state where it has higher organic matter, but can't keep going on, up and up um, indefinitely. Okay, this is a great question. Um, for Emily, do you have any stories of successes and failures with cover crop growth or integration? <laughs> so many. <laughs> um, okay, well, tell us one. <laughs> so I, yes, I, I'm starting my 18th season farming, um, and I've been growing cover crops the entire time. Um, what I would say is that it's never really a failure, um, even if the cover crop doesn't do what you want it to do, even if that's to germinate, because that is always some information that you can use. I mean, certainly, probably the, the most obvious failure is seeds that I've kept that are too old, <laughs> hoping that. Um, you know, they'll go ahead and still be useful. But I think the biggest successes are just starting piecemeal. Um, We started with, you know, in essence, one cover crop, which was winter rye. Um, And at this point for our fall winter cover crop, we're growing six different crops and the same number for our summer cover crop. Um, So the success for us that I would illustrate um, would be what you and I were talking about earlier, Alice, is that we actually intentionally end our season a little bit early and 
well, this isn't necessarily applicable to everyone's farm. If there are fields that farmers have that they can take out of production by strategically planning their cropping schedule so that they have swaths of fields that, you know, come out of production in, let's say, August, September, and they're able to plant a fall winter cover crop as soon as possible, the amount of growth that you see is just so much more dramatic. Um, but I think, you know, the biggest overall success is that having done this so many years now, we really can truly just visibly see much less looking at the soil test results, the impact the cover crops have had on soil tilth. Um, and we're in an area where we can get incredible rains and we've actually gotten nine inches of rain once in a two and a half hour period, mm -hmm. which was crazy, but that's, you know, climate change is creating that. So I feel like the cover crops are the success story just for our farm's overall health. Um, and the final thought is just in an ideal world, we'd love to see most, if not all, although I know folks say it's not possible, of our fertility coming from our cover crops. Um, that after having applied manure um, in our earlier years on this farm. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Emily. Um, we have time for one last question here, I think. Um, and that is, how do you manage cover crops on perennial versus annual um, system? Several of the programs I see are more focused on annual crops. Mm. Emily, do you have Mark, some thoughts you on that? Take... Oh, you want me to take it? <laughs> well, <on> <laughs> yeah. I, no, I'm, I'm willing to share my experiences with uh, perennial systems. Uh, those being both orchard, blueberry, and asparagus perennial systems. And I would say that, you know, unfortunately, the asparagus is another failure example. Um, it was pretty hard to get cover crop system within um, basically a row crop perennial. It was moderately successful in a blueberry system, but um, anywhere that you know, you have the potential for perennial weeds like Bermuda grass creeping in, it becomes pretty challenging and most successful um, in the orchard system that we have. And we have a, just a grain drill, no-till grain drill that's super old that still can successfully overseed a cover crop um, within an orchard system or even successfully broadcasting within um but it's basically like, you know, just a native grass and wildflower system underneath the orchard. Mm. Mark, yeah, I'm not surprised you... that it's, you had the greatest success with the orchard and the greatest challenge with the asparagus. I have heard of growers planting either buckwheat or soybean or a mixture of the two into asparagus after the harvest is finished. You, you, you're harvesting just as it comes up and then you come to a point you say, okay, let's let the asparagus grow to regenerate for the next year. If you seed the cover crops, then uh, the asparagus will go over the top, will overtop these low growing cover crops. So instead of you have a, having a mat of weeds, you have a mat of cover crops. Um, and sometimes they even provide some biological pest control uh, you know, against asparagus beetle. Uh, the, your soybean can fix nitrogen. And uh, some farmers, I don't know whether you do this, Emily, but some farmers um, mow their um, asparagus at the end of the season, and that also is a time to mow down the cover crop, uh, and they just leave this, this kind of mulch layer uh, for the soil life to slowly work back into the soil. Yeah, we did try overseeding cow peas. Uh, multiple times in the asparagus. But I think, you know, the tricky part is that even if you get a weed-free bed before you plant um, something like asparagus, if you have any biodiversity around your field, you're very likely to end up getting weed seeds mm -hmm. back in the fields. And I also don't believe you can ever really get a fully weed-free soil. There are seeds that remain dormant for decades and beyond. Um, so the challenge for us was just weed pressure actually interfering with our cover crop plans when it mm. came to asparagus. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, the weeds are always a perennial challenge. And I think we're all in this huge research experiment moving forward, farmers and uh, uh, scientists alike, as to how to 
overcome some of the challenges uh, that weeds present in maintaining, uh, uh, you know, a healthy soil. And, you know, some weeds you can live with, you could just let them be part of the cover crop and other weeds, they, they just take over and they and they just need more aggressive management, uh, Bermuda grass being one of those. Um, and it may well be they up here in Appalachia were just that much cooler or have that much lighter weed pressure. We don't have Bermuda grass up here. We have a slightly lesser perennial called quack grass that behaves similarly, but it's more cool season and it's not quite as aggressive. Okay. Well, well, and I think this just kind of circles back to that question about funding. And I think, you know, the more that we farmers and consumers can request funding for these various research questions within organic, I think mm. that that um, will help speed that process along to getting viable answers that we can execute on our fields. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you so much, Mark and Emily yeah, sure. for doing this presentation today and Emily for being online for the questions. That was great to have you here. And um, thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you thank all. You.